Thanks for listening in to Conversations with Alice and Jay, The Journey to Hear. Please remember to subscribe, hit the like button and share. I, I actually think that we needed this on different levels. Um, I think the earth needed a bit of cleansing. Yeah. Um, and whereas I think in the past we weren't taking so much from the earth and the natural resources, mm -hmm. we weren't bleeding the earth dry. And so as soon as we reap something, we've got to put something else in the ground. And yeah. as soon as we've had one fix, we've got to get the other fix and mm -hmm. just running, running, running. Whereas now there's a lot of space between things, yeah. including between people. Mm. Talking about social distancing, yeah. talking about you can't just travel where you are able to or where you want to and sometimes not even where you need to. <laughs> so, you know, it's like a whole host of things that's happening around us that cause us to think, have time to think, um, have time to prepare, reflect, Mm. Time to regret, time to, you know, fix that, up and all kind of things. Right? Yeah. And this is where I'm going to actually introduce you now. So, Novlet, Novlet Aldrin is, to me, words cannot describe who Novlet is to me, but to try and put it into words, Novlet has known me my whole life. And the way I could say me my whole life is because Novlet is my godmother. And I am very proud to be able to say that. And um, Lockett is the founder of Tranquility Counseling, an exceptionally qualified and experienced service in delivering one on one therapy, couple therapy, both premarital and married couples, among other services. And Novlet is also an appointed affiliate counselor for the organizations largely dealing with stress and injury at work for frontline staff in customer care and the National Health Service. Novlet qualified in 1996 and explored with Tranquility since 97, during which time Tranquility successfully completed projects and helped hundreds of clients and cu couples. Years of life experiences, training and practice in diverse situations such as education, the NHS and the penal system with religious settings have all enhanced the practical and therapeutic work done by Tranquility. Noble Aldrich, thank you so much for joining us here on Conversations with Alice and Jay, The Journey to Hear, talking about mental health, therapy, counselling, and just anything else we decide to chit chat about as well. So thank you for joining Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, I've had many invitations and with you, even if I wanted to say no, I wouldn't know how to begin to form the letters, nor my mouth, nor my tongue to wrap around the no, because I love you and I am also very proud of you. And all your achievements are so many, I don't know all of them, I'm sure, uh, because you wear them all well. And when I've seen you in different settings, they don't wear you, you wear them. So. Thank you. It's an honour. It's my honour. Thank you. Thank you. So, well, yeah, going back to what we were saying, because I don't even want to get emotional, so you know, I'm just going to kind of listen to that yeah. later by myself. And <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you. But what you were saying, it gives us time to regret, and it's and um, it's many people. It's given them the space and the time to press the pause button, and actually deal with some issues that we had become so busy and the busyness was because we were trying to not deal with things absolutely a lot of people that are faced with themselves and that's the worst one <laughs> yeah yes because somebody said something to me the other day and i said look i'm not trying to get into your head because i barely want to be in my own so yeah. <laughs> no but it's true because because like for prime example that just before this all happened i moved 
And I'm mm. on my own for the first time in years. Mm. And so the fact that you've got the social distancing and offices are closed and cinemas are closed, because there's many times I was never that person that thought, oh, I need somebody to go on a holiday with, or I need somebody to go mm. to the cinema with. If I wanted to go watch a movie, I'd pick up myself and I'd go to the movie. Or yeah. I've gone on vacations many times by myself yeah. rather than waiting for people. So, yeah. and, and, but still, even though you go somewhere by yourself, you still have people to interact with when you... Absolutely. Can. Yeah, so choice. That, right. So the fact that all of that is shut down, slowed down, taken away, and there's many people... And so, so when you're saying about mental health at the moment being right, I can just imagine all those people that live by themselves that have mm. had that... The, that human interaction taken away. Yes, you can pick up the phone. Yes, you can do a FaceTime or a Zoom mm. or a Teams mm. or whatever. Mm. But sometimes just being able to sit next to somebody and just... Yeah. Or just, yeah. Or just look over and see another person. Or, and, and so I can imagine how that must be for some people, mm. that mm. isolation and what it's doing to their mental health. Mm. So, well, yeah, one of the things uh, I deal with a lot of people who are living on their own, mm -hmm. for whom their mental health has um, deteriorated really bad. For some people, it happened rapidly. For some people, they were trying to do their best and they just can't hold it together any longer. And as many as I speak to, I am still finding it difficult to fully grasp what it means for them mm. you know and I hear it I'm trying to understand it but it's one of those things that I really can't get totally into and it's an imagination for me um, I'm trying to do an imagery of what does somebody do when they are totally by themselves and it's not for you know somebody's gone away for a week or two weeks it's not like that it is morning noon and night and it really, months. when they tell me, it's horrible. Yeah, months. You know, the things that they normally do monthly has come around a few times. You know, the bills they would pay monthly have come around. And, you know, the cycle has begun of this long lonesomeness. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it really is the, the knock-on effect is too much. The services. Mm. And one of the things, I was speaking to somebody very recently, and I know there are vast differences, but it made me think of a prisoner in solitary confinement. So even though we can put on the television or we can pick up the phone or we can go on the internet or go on social media, but there is still an element of isolation that you're that you're right. surrounded by and i thought to myself i when you watch these movies of um a prisoner being taken out of um what did i just call it solitary confinement solitary, solitary confinement and yeah. when you watch these movies of when they're taken out or when they have the actors playing how they're in there talking to themselves and if there are things are happening to them while they're in there it just made me think my gosh if I'm feeling like this and I have the television and I have the mm -hmm. and I have my phone and I'm, already, and I'm starting to feel some kind of way like, okay, I need to get out of here. Then I'm thinking, my God, no, it is, it is true that they, depending on how long they're in there, that's, I can see how they have now come out having completely lost their minds. Absolutely. And that's for people as well, who've never experienced any form of mental disorder at all. Right, that's the key. That, and I'm so glad you said that because that's the thing. Many people think that in order to have a mental breakdown or something, you have to have some kind of underlying. Absolutely. But that's not necessarily true in all cases, is it? Nope, nope. Because what, what this kind of time does, it gets deep down into the who you really are. Mm -hmm. And for some people, there's always been perhaps 
a, a link or two that they've never really joined up in terms of who they are, what they're about, and you know, survival for them has not ever been on the agenda because they've been able to get on and do all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And and that when that hits them, and then when you for some some of those people they've listened to the news mm -hmm. and when there is no good news yes. or the or the glimpse of good news amongst the mountains of bad news. Yes. Just you just can't can't help yourself in that. Mm. Do you know? And last week we had um, an experience at home, which we'd never thought of, never had to think about, um, and it's without electricity. And the good thing was it was daytime. Mm. I was on a Zoom, husband's on a Zoom, and everything is going, everything is absolutely fine, the sun is shining, couldn't want for better weather. You know, great to be working in, at home, in the comfort, and all the rest of that. And, um, everything went. Lights went, electric went, and you can see that, well, the laptop has some life in it. Mm. So I think, you know what, I better turn it off. Preserve. <laughs> the phone has some life in it, and I'm thinking, I'll send my last few calls and turn it off. Um, and I have an extra charger that I have for traveling, really. And every now and then I charge it up. So I was able to charge my phone to 94%. Now I felt rich. <laughs> oh, wow. I was, I was like rich. Because mm. I had something to keep me connected. Mm. I thought, sure, we're going to make a cup of tea. Oh, no what? electricity. Yes. Because <laughs> part of me was thinking, we have a gas cooker. It doesn't work unless you switch on the electricity. So I thought to myself, if the absolute worst comes to the worst, this is me problem solving for myself, you know, <laughs> not a patient, not a client. At the moment, I'm the one in need. Mm. Um, and I sent out a few messages to a few people. So I think I'll need to borrow your camping stove. You know, goes a long way for a joke. And then I thought to myself, I know, I've got a barbecue. And I've got some stuff and I've got matches. If the worst comes to the worst, I can at least have a hot drink. And I would like the barbecue to make sure. And all of these things was going through my mind. And then I'm thinking of people that I'm actually working with. Mm -hmm. When one thing happens, sometimes everything crashes. Yeah because it's their one survival kit. Mm. Yeah, I had other resources and other thinking abilities that yeah. could say to me, okay, don't worry, if the worst comes to the worst, I can do something, you know? That taught me that our reliance on the things that are to hand, if it really went, and it wasn't going to come back on in, in the five hours what they said it would come mm -hmm. back on because it was a major whatever. How would I really cope? That's interesting. Um, because I went through an experience like that having moved to Florida eight years ago. And um, as you know, mum's lived in Florida for years. Yeah. And there's always been the time when I would get a message from her, if you can't find me, I'm in the hurricane shelter because it's hurricane season. Yeah. And you know, those were the nerve wracking times. It's like, okay, this lady needs to move away from Florida because my nerves can't take this. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I can't get hold of her, right? So, um, so then what happens eight years ago, I moved to Florida and hurricane seasons start and come around. But you see, the thing is, because we know it's hurricane season, we can prepare. 
Absolutely. You can get the little camping stove with the little mm -hmm. containers, canisters of gas, mm -hmm. and yeah. all the perishables and stock up on water because they say you must have X amount of water per person per day. So doing the math calculation to make sure you've got enough water and, and things like that. So you have it and you put it down. And mm. most years it's a tropical storm. Nothing happens. Mm. You're good. Yeah. But yes. there was one year when... It says, that's it, evacuate, hurricane's coming. So we're like, we're not evacuating. We're going to stay put. And then nothing happened. It's like, oh, this is a breeze. I got two days off. And the weather was great. Two years later, they say, okay, this one's coming. And it's going to be worse than Andrew. So you know everybody's hunkering down and all the rest. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, it wasn't as bad as Andrew. But it was bad enough that it knocked out our electricity. Yeah. So, so even though, and beforehand, again, preparing, we thought, okay, let's cook all this food, mm -hmm. and the kind of food that we could still eat cold, even though it's cooked and things like that, preparing and everything. And then the hurricane hit. The first thing to go was the power. Now, just because it's a hurricane doesn't mean it's cold. So, you know, you're sitting in a hot place. Oh, no. Burn. No AC because the electricity is gone. It's just like, okay, 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 okay. But even though the power went, we still had cell service. So like, okay, great. Then that went. So, and it was a case of, okay, we can do this. We can do this. But that feeling of being isolated again, and then it's also, and with, an isolation with a real threat outside because me yes. and I was quick because this is my this is my first experience of a hurricane. I'm out at the window with my phone recording. <laughs> I'm seriously like this. You know, you know, forgetting that something could come fly, some missile could come flying in through the window or something because it's a hurricane, right? But I my first hurricane and I was there recording it and I was watching it and and um, no electricity, no cell service, no way to be connected at all. And so, so to your point about being able to, but because we knew, because you're given that warning, you can yeah. prepare. But what yeah. happens when, like, for example, this pandemic, mm. there was no warning. No. So, so you've got so many people that are thrown into a situation, and many of them, if the truth be told, were hanging on by a thread anyway. I know. I know. <sighs> yes yes so for you in the profession and I've realized I haven't even introduced you properly so we're going to do that in a minute and so for you in the profession I mean how does that how how because you know your point about say you're saying that they you you couldn't even begin to imagine what some of them were feeling because for yourself, like you said, you've got your husband and you, mm. so you're there with someone. But then you've got some people that even though they're there with their husbands, I'm hearing divorce rates are up. Oh, yeah. And don't talk about domestic abuse. No, we want to talk about domestic abuse because we try we want to blow the lid right off. These things. Well, there is no lid. Wow. <laughs> there is no lid. Not anymore. It's awful. Everything has just skyrocketed. It's horrendous. If, if this was something to answer situations that said, well, look, you've got this house. Mm -hmm. It's fully insured. But it's got lots of work to be done in this house. So you work hard work extra you patch this side and then you patch the other side because you don't have enough money and enough resources you can't really do the whole building mm. so when you've done one bit the other bit that where you started also now needs attention right. so it's an ongoing work that is never actually going to 
reach its full potential. Mm. And I think some relationships are a bit like that. They're full of patches. Yes. And whilst ever, while ever they're patching, it feels as if they're doing something and they're getting somewhere and they will get somewhere and it will be all right because we're working on it. But if it was a house and the last carpenter you got was really, really good, you try to get that carpenter back. And that mm -hmm. carpenter says, uh, I'm no longer doing carpentry or I've moved out the area. or I'm not taking on any extra work because they're so good. Mm. You know, so you go and you get somebody else. So even the same work cannot be seamless mm. because they work in different ways. And so the same for the relationships. As you patch and sometimes different people get involved and different people work in different ways. Mm -hmm. So some will say, well, let's just fix the top so that everything looks all right and everything's fine. But on the inside, it's still breaking down. Mm. And so sometimes a storm could become a blessing in disguise. Yeah. Because yeah. it knock off so many slates off the roof <laughs> that, you know, the leak, yeah. The leaking roof can now be fixed mm. with the insurance because it's knocked off the slates. Mm. Something else might happen and blow in, you know, a few windows blow in so you can do stuff. But when I look at this pandemic in terms of what it's doing to people, it's like rocking the foundations. Mm. Government are spinning out of control because they are still practicing. And although none of us have ever seen this, there are very few people who are still alive who were around in the last pandemic, mm. you know, the last big pandemic, because I know we have them several times over. There are very few of them. And what they learned then, or what they were told then, mm -hmm. they are not really equipped to help us now. So the foundations are really rocked. Um, and I... Every now and then I've become a bit of a news freak. <laughs> so <laughs> I will watch the news and I will listen to this one and I'll listen to that one and I think, what you're telling me you're following, you've missed because you've not taken it into consideration. So people are saying, well, you need to do this, you need to do this because you've said this. Hey, everybody who's trying is really trying and some people are very trying when they tell you the information and you know they don't know. Yeah. You ever hear yeah. them answer a question? Um, could, you, could, you, could you clarify this for me? And when they're finished going around the houses, even mm. you forget the question you've asked. Yeah, exactly. And, that, and they're masters at that. Spin doctors, right? They are absolute masters at that. And it's so true. You know, something that you said about they try to fix the top and it's almost like you do plastic surgery or cosmetic surgery. They don't call it plastic yep. surgery anymore. Cosmetic, so yeah. Myself. You do cosmetic surgery, but you don't go and fix the heart disease problem that you've got. As you said that, that's exactly what came to me. You're, you're fixing all the external, you're doing your nip and tuck and you're pulling mm -hmm. back and you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're Brazilian yeah. butt lift and yeah. all the rest of it. Yeah. But you're suffering from heart disease and you're not, you're not addressing that, which is actually yeah. more important than the nip and tuck. Yeah. And it is where priorities lie really, isn't it? And there's something there about people's background, um, their family way of dealing with issues. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I have found in lots of different walks is the family way of dealing with issues tend to continue to the next generation and in the next generation. But then is that because, because it's funny you said the family way of dealing with issues, doesn't it continue into the next generations because they're not dealt with? So it's not really the family way of dealing with it. The family's way yep. of 
just not dealing with it and that thing handed down. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. It is the not dealing with mm. um, which precipitates the issues, whatever they are. Only thing is, one of the things I found is that the next generation have a different way of dressing it up. So, if you imagine one generation used to put it in brown bags, mm -hmm. brown paper, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. fine. The next generation, and you know what England, wrap it in chips paper. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The, the later style chips paper, mm -hmm. by the way, not the newspaper one. And so you move it along. Then the next one think, well, actually it could make this look a little bit better. Mm. So their paper is perhaps a bit thicker um, and might have a few pictures on. Mm -hmm. The next one say, let's go for words which are enticing and, and it's now shiny. Mm -hmm. Technically, what we find when we strip away is that it's the same thing, just wrapped differently. Exactly. And, you know, to your point, so that because many people listening may not know what chips paper is. So it's, it's like another way to put it is. So one generation, <laughs> starts, I know, right? One generation starts and it's in a brown paper bag. And then the, then the technology yeah. is advanced. So now it's in a plastic carrier bag. And now we've moved to the yeah. fashionable thing of we've got those reusable tote bags, those canvas bags. But you still literally yep. take the same junk, yep, absolutely. taking it out of the paper bag, yep. put it in the plastic bag, taking it out of the plastic bag, putting it into the tote bag. Because every generation, because a, a plastic bag may not have been what was available 50 years ago. Yep. And the tote bag certainly wasn't that thing. So absolutely. this is the same, just taking that same stuff mm. and just repackaging it, redressing it, rather mm. than... And, that, and that's the thing that... Um, because, you know, going back to um, some of the mental health issues, when we look at it and we think that every generation in some aspects has more to deal with than the generation before, more, more external social pressures come into Absolutely. it. Because, yeah. like, my grandma, love her, God rest her soul, my grandma, I'm just thinking, would my grandma know what social media, huh? Social <laughs> what? I think, because my <clears throat> grandma passed away, what? 2016. So my grandma passed away 14 years ago. So I, and obviously before that she had dementia. So I don't even know if grandma even really know what a, knew what a mobile phone was really, because like, she never had one, because they weren't mm. the before she passed. Mm. So... <clears throat> So when you so so now when you look at the whole things that this generation have to deal with because we are now cash rich and time poor. Uh, yep. So so I mean, how does so have you seen because I know that you have been practicing for many many years. So have you seen how the different generations are affected by mental health issues and how what does that look like? I think many years ago and and in for some people and for some cultures mental health did not have a name mm. yeah and in some cultures especially where it's brought on later on in life as people perhaps, perhaps have gone through hard things mm. uh very challenging situations then we always find a way to dress it okay yeah? And as a child, um, I used to hear that one not well. But you see, it, for us, in our culture, it's more than words. It's the expression. If you can see the face okay. and you hear the tone, mm. and the tone is, hmm, I'm not well, you know. I'm not writing. I'm not writing. That's, that's, yes. that's the one that's writing. Yes. Yeah, no. But... In the not right, it is often in like um, a kind of telling off, tracing kind of, mm. you know, way. It's like almost dismissive, you know. Right. Basically, yeah. you don't need to take any notice of that one because I'm not right. Yes, that is so true. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Whereas 
when we want to talk about someone who's not well, it, it's a kind of coming from a deeper kind of place mm. with a hint of sadness. But you know, so, sorry to cut you there, but when you say a hint of sadness, don't you find, or didn't you find years ago, not only a hint of sadness, but in depending on who it was coming from, there was um, maybe a hint of disgust and shame. Well, disgust and shame would depend on who you're talking about. Mm. Yeah. So, whereas coming from oh, a very oh, judge. Sorry, but you know, I was about to say you were about to say judgmental. That's exactly right. Yes. Where yeah. they're, kind of, they're saying they're not well in a kind of condescending, looking down on them kind of way. Yeah. Yeah. Or even, or even in a mo in a more crimson side side way to it. It's like almost serve you right kind wow. of thing because, well, that's a judgmental side. Mm -hmm. So. If you, your family and my family had a real to-do and it could have gone on for two or three generations mm. and then somebody presents from that family, somebody presents with um, mental health issues, then um, it's almost like mm. God's judgment. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, and so we find... Pretty it up with, yeah, because you know, God don't like ugly and you reap what you sow, so they can't start throwing all of that out there. Wow, yeah. wow, yeah. and so what you find is that lack of appreciation, that lack of sensitivity, and a great dollop of ignorance, you know, that goes on until it becomes something that's in that other side of family that shows up suddenly i'm not well mm. and the idea of keeping it secret covering it up forgive their misdemeanors around the issue and cover up their lack so what was happening back then a lot of people were not getting any treatment mm. so even sometimes if people went to the doctor you would hear things like the doctor says him nerves and you just you know so many little phrases mm -hmm. uh, that were acceptable but meant no treatment no exposure no treatment, no exposure of a mental health issue breakdown. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Goodness, that's that's you know what that's a revelation because that way, as you say that, I'm thinking about yes because growing up, that's what you used to hear, and obviously as a child coming up, not well as you could think is it was I don't know heart disease, kidney disease, yeah, stomach ache, right? Yeah, but yeah, a broken leg, yeah as opposed to a broken individual, a broken person. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. But, um, but to me, mental health is very important. And we don't talk about it enough. And when I say talk about it, I don't mean just we're talking about it. I mean talking about it actively doing something to bring awareness, to get people the help that they want. Because I, like, I remember many years ago, Growing up in London, there was this man. Um, he was in around the South Harrow area. And this man was, back then we would call them tramps. Um, now we would call them homeless. Um, uh, back then, when I was coming up, we would see this man, and we, this tramp. And he was, never harm anybody. And we would just, just see him. Years later, we got to find out that what happened to the man that led to him becoming homeless and living on the streets, apparently he was a very successful accountant, mm. had a whole wife family, and the wife left him, cleaned him out, took everything, and it broke him. And thus, and it's not to say that because the wife took everything, he couldn't continue working and rebuilding mm -hmm. himself. He absolutely could because he was a very successful top accountant in London at the time. But the 
experiences of that broke him to the point this man lived on the streets for years now my thing is if we had seen that and known that and i'm thinking to myself where was this man's family even to give him the help and the support he needed because if that was the case i'm not saying he wouldn't have ended up on the streets for years i'm not saying that but maybe he may not have ended up on the streets for so many years if there was some kind of help and support and acknowledgement that guess what men can men can be broken absolutely and things can happen to them that causes that and when i found out the truth my heart went out to him because i'm thinking wow wow there was no <laughs> underlying anything it was just a life change a life circumstances circumstance that happened that mm. broke him mm. And that is so easily done um, when you think from where he was to where you saw him might seem like a, a long distance mm. given all his talents, experiences and, and his know-how. However, understanding how someone becomes broken mm. and what becomes broken within them mm. um, is actually two different things. Because the how he became broken, his wife left him. What broke inside him is completely different. Mm. And one of the things that we all need to take note of is that we are all pretty much one step from being homeless. Wow. Just one. Mm. And for most people, and this is a majority, generalizing, but in the majority of cases, someone loses their health, they lose their job, it's downhill. Mm. Or they just lose their job, they lose their house, and all the connections they have, particularly the ones who depend on people and take from people, yes. and not think about giving back to that person. So in that situation, we are all very close to being like that. Mm -hmm. Or if somebody loses their mental health and fall into mental ill health, the same thing happens. Oftentimes, especially if they become in hospital mm -hmm. or if they become a nuisance in their environment, they become evicted, they're hospitalized. And if they get sectioned, then that's almost like having a record. Oh, it is? So, well, because if they've got, if they've been sectioned under the Mental Health Act, during that process, you have your rights taken away from you. Oh, yeah. yeah, there are lots of restrictions. And sometimes when you, if you're not guided into safe places to work, some people end up being without a job for many, many years and they're on benefits. And the longer you leave it, it is said somebody who's out of work for a month, mm -hmm. just a regular person going to work, become not even redundant, but just lose their jobs. Yeah. They say that if they're off work for a month, they are likely to become depressed. So somebody then becomes depressed mm. and a whole host of other things start happening to them. Lots of people will draw away from, if I became really depressed, if mm. I became clinically depressed, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I'd lose my friends. Yes. Some of my family may feel that it's perhaps catching or they can't afford, you know, and some people who used to love to see me and be with me somehow don't see me that way anymore. Mm. So I become a real liability. I become a burden. When I realize that I am a burden to someone, I become ashamed. I lose my self-esteem. 
I can't find the way back into a job. And when I go to fill in a form and it says, have you had any serious illnesses? Uh, and I'm going down the list and then I have to tick mental ill health, mm. hospital stay. Oh, yes, 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 yes. It's a vicious cycle, isn't it? Absolutely. And vicious is the correct term. My because if, I, if the skill I have may depend on me being of what they class, what they class as fit mind. Mm. But when you put that on the thing, some employers look differently at that. We'd love you. You've got a lot of skills and, you know, you did really well on the interview. It's just that somebody else got the job who has more experience than you or, you know. And sometimes you wonder when you hear that. It's sometimes I think, hold on, I invented that. Who the hell's going to have more experience than me? <laughs> <laughs> what would I have to do to have yeah. more experience? Invent the thing? Like, seriously? Yeah. So, yeah. Own the company. <laughs> Right. Own the company, <laughs> and it's 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 such you know as you're saying that it is it is a vicious cycle, isn't it? Because it's because I know if, if I um, use myself an ex as an example, I remember there was a time in my life I was sick. One of the times I was sick, not that I'm a sickly person, but I didn't know what was wrong with me. And every time I went to the doctor, the doctor would tell me I had indigestion. But I but this, now anybody that knows me knows. Listen. I need, I probably need to repent because my belly is my God at times. And I, I can testify to that. Right? <laughs> I like to eat. I do. And, but nothing was staying down. So I'm thinking, okay, something's wrong here. So I go to the doctor and I remember the doctor gave me um, indigestion tablets. I remember I threw it to the back of my dresser and forgot about it. I only found it again when I was clearing everything out, when I was moving. I'm like, oh yeah, this. And, um, but I knew something was wrong. And, um, one of the, uh, there was a young lady, I used to, she and I used to party like all the time. We'd go out several times a week to party. And uh, so I remember calling her, not feeling well. So I'm thinking she's my friend, right? You know what she said to me? So what's wrong with you now? And it's like, nothing. And I put the phone down. I was just, and, I, and that kind of made me, really made me sit back, like, wow, that's, what's wrong with you now? So if somebody's saying that to me, and not a sickly person, was out with this person raving, partying in, on a regular basis, because we met because we worked together, so she knew that I wasn't that person. But for that to be the response, so then if we take it back to what you were saying, about somebody that's depressed and if they were to get that same response from somebody that they considered a friend what in the world would it do to what's left of that person's mental state and 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 that as an example if you like remains a live example of many people's experience because then it is at the time that person is actually reaching out for mm. some help mm. as opposed to somebody rushing in. I hear you're not well, so I'll come to make you better. You know, and put a stop to that. Uh, it's very different. So here it is, if you like it, blame the sick for being sick. Ooh. Say that again. Ooh. Blame the sick for being sick. It's a bit like blame the victim. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah. So, and if that person who's reached out, whenever someone reaches out to someone, it says a few things. It says, I'm reaching out to you because I trust you. Mm-hmm. I'm reaching out to you because I think you can help me. Mm -hmm. I'm reaching out to you because I think you have my back. Yes. You, you are concerned about me. 
And I'm reaching out to you because I think you and I have a relationship in which I could be sheltered, I could be safe. And so I'm reaching out to you. So basically, someone would choose someone yeah. when they reach out. Yes. And I think people miss that it's an honor to be chosen for someone to give to them that thing, that part of them that hurts, to share with them that innermost bit of their being by that. And when they get the answer, they realize you're not one. And you're certainly not the one for me. Mm. Then that withdrawal says, I'm not worthy. I am not worthy and I cannot. And if you won't help me, nobody oh, wow. will. And that's, that's so key what you're saying there because when you because when you're saying that you withdraw okay what came to mind for me was it's almost puts on an added layer of guilt on yourself that you chose wrong so like how could i have not known that this person wouldn't have been there for me so if this person that i really thought would be there for me isn't that means i have no one yeah and it means that the relationship I thought I had mm -hmm. was in my mind. Because it was so more now, to me than it was to them, obviously. Absolutely. My and God. no one wants to be in a one-way relationship. Mm -hmm. Of yeah. any kind, whether it be a friendship. <laughs> of, that's, you know, that's so key. No one wants to be in a one-way relationship, regardless mm -hmm. of the level of that relationship whether it be in employment, whether it be a friendship, whether it be a relationship, any kind of thing, it has to be a two-way street. Absolutely. Like some people say, um, you say, well, why are you in the job you're in? No. I can tell you, they pay you. Even if you complain about the pay, Mm -hmm. or the working conditions, at least you know they're going to pay you. The time they stop paying you and the promise of payment isn't coming, mm. you soon find another job. Yeah, you're gone. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and the truth is, and, and like you know, you quite rightly say that so many people say that, because I was going to ask you, why do you do the job you do? Because mm. to work in the mental health field, it can't be easy. It, it's... It can't be easy. What led you to even begin on this path? <laughs> Several things. And it goes back a long, long way. Um, in terms of where it started, it started in 1992, which is not so long ago in that way. It started when the job, my substantial job, as a residential social worker, looking after children with lots of different types of learning disabilities, and some of it was also mental health, but they were children. Mm -hmm. And some of those children were very big. I mean, boxer size big. Wow. Because they'd had mental health issues, and a lot of them had medication, and a lot of them had growth issues. Some were overgrown, some were undergrown. And uh, when they had a really bad turn, they were strong. I mean, Mike Tyson strong. And I, you know, I have heard that in many cases where um, people that have mental health issues, when they are having an episode or a crisis, it's like this suit, this like Hulk like strength. Yeah. Within. Absolutely, yeah. So, uh, yeah, and you don't really relate that and put that to that happening with children. You just look, yep. yeah, wow, yep. that's interesting. And it, it was actually a five-year-old, it was a five-year-old helped me to make my mind up. She was very tiny, very petite and very wiry, but she can jump really high from a standing start. 
I mean, really high. And there was one day, uh, with all the protection and everything else, there were two of us holding her. One was holding one hand. You know, not like arms in her up. We were holding her hand. Okay. No, so you weren't restraining her, just literally just... No, we weren't restraining her. We were just both holding her to let her jump it out, basically. Okay, got you. Because she was in this thing and she was, you know, and she, like, she'd stiffen herself, but she was still jumping. I think, how do you do it? And there was two of us holding her, and I thought to myself, I cannot hold a five-year-old. So after that shift, I made an appointment with my boss, and I asked to be redeployed elsewhere the fact that i'd also had surgery and returned to work mm -hmm. um and i thought this isn't worth it good pay and everything else but not worth it and she put me on the redeployment list mm -hmm. and she said she thinks that i'd be good in mental health and i went <laughs> okay <laughs> as you do <laughs> you do yeah because Although I'd been in touch with people with mental health. One lived in our house when I was a child. And I was never afraid of her. Mm. Never. Everybody else was afraid of her. We'd talk and stuff. She'd come to my room. I was never afraid. Mm. And I said, yeah, I'll give it a go. It was a kind of day center. So it wasn't like hospital. And, that. and that's how I had my first introduction. Okay. Then, so that was like, general then from there i moved into black mental health mm. in 1993 i went to black mental health and i have worked in a lot of black mental health situations whether it's housing projecting or different places um till i did the same for counseling and it just seemed quite natural for me Mm. Um, from there I even used to go and visit my clients, patients when they were in prison that's, that's interesting um, and I, I, it was I, it seemed like a really dangerous and that's what I was going to ask you so so, to my, so, so just, right, just wanted to stick a pin right here for a second visiting some of your clients in prison so you have people in prison suffering from mental health issues. Shouldn't those people be in a mental health institution and not a prison? Well, there's two sides to that. Mm -hmm. some, some had what they class as enough capacity. Okay, okay. Yep, in that. Some were in hospital. Like, I don't know if you've heard of the big Rampton. No. In, in, in England, Rampton is big, big, secure. Oh, Lots so of secure mental health facility? Yeah. Okay. So that, for me, is all but prison. Wow. Because they have done wrong, or deemed to have done wrong in some cases, mm -hmm. and therefore they were in a mental health institution but treated pretty much like prisoners. So every time you open and close the door, it was locked. Every time you went to see someone, it was locked. Right, right. Um, when I, so I would be assigned to people who were in prison and also about to be released into the community. So there were all the risk factors, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so we would be dealing with people like, people who were known sex offenders, for example, known murderers, right. um, and other misdemeanors. So hold on, so, I'm some, so some of your clients were known murderers. Now I know yeah. people can't see this from here, but you don't strike me as somebody that would be going into prison and just sitting there as, with a, your client, a murderer or, you know, and we say murderers. 
So I'm just thinking, and I'm saying this because I know you, because anybody knows you, you're, it's not like you're of big stature and you're, 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 you're quite slight yourself. So I, well. I would say no, no, because honestly, because I, because you know, I know people that I know grown men, six foot two, uh, and, and there's just no way that they would go into that environment and i'm talking men that are in the gym every day and that you know they're yep. out on the street like yep. you know. yep. so but there's no way they would go in those environments much less mm. yourself a mm. woman slight a slightly <clears throat> woman at that sitting there with clients that are murderers and sex offenders hmm. yeah. well the truth about where how that came about and my saying yes to that goes back to the time when I first became a Christian. Okay. Well, or even before that, I did martial arts. Okay. So there's a kind of martial discipline that goes, <laughs> it's good. It's good to have under your belt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's a lot. It's like, okay. It's like, okay, okay. I get it. <laughs> Pardon the pun, but yes, under your belt is a good thing. Um, so I, from a very young age as a teenager, mm -hmm. learnt the art of keeping myself safe. Okay. Um, and I'm not afraid. When I worked in the children's section, respite, Many of the staff would go off sick because they've been beaten up. I've never been beaten up. My God. Never been slapped. Never. I've been threatened to be bitten. And I showed him my own teeth. <laughs> <laughs> As you do. <laughs> and he forgot that one. Um, <laughs> you know, but I've never really ever been afraid. Mm. Um, in, in that sort of sense, because I've always felt that I have something within me right. that just helps me. So in that sort of sense, um, I was kind of being prepared. Okay. But coming up through all of that, and I remember the first person that I actually went in to see that was a murderer coming out who had done his done his time basically mm -hmm. um the guard on the door asked me if i wanted him to come in he was just being courteous mm -hmm. so i said no and he looked at me <laughs> and he asked me again so i said no he says but this is i says no i said you stand there you can look through the window because you can see through the glass mm -hmm. um, through the top of the door. I said, you'll know if I need you. Mm -hmm. I don't need you. And I'd never met this man. Wow. And I went in, closed the door. I, he asked me to sit down. I waited for him to ask me to sit down. And I greeted him and all the rest of it. And he sat down and I sat down. And the two of us sat face to face for the length of the visit. Wow. And I got up and um, when I got up and left, the man said to me, what did you do to him? Treated him like a person? I said to him, I didn't do anything to him. I just showed him respect. Yeah. And walk out. Because at that time, I actually lived in Sheffield. Okay. Sheffield did a lot of making of me in that. I, this is how I received it, and this is how I described it, whether or not doesn't really matter to me i found that when i went to sheffield after a little while i i built up this kind of militancy 
which I felt I saw within the council, largely the council workers um, in Sheffield, and and they were very pro-black, and they were very union orientated, mm -hmm. and basically not always wanting a pound of flesh, but they wanted the things that they wanted, and they had meetings and they fought for it, and they got some of what they wanted. And I thought, I actually like this. Mm. I could work with people whom I know where I stand. Yes. And if I don't like it, I can deal with it mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in that. So that and being in the black mental health, understanding some of what went on within the mental health system, mm -hmm. the disparity that was prevalent um, and so on and so forth. So there were times when I would go to um, secure units um, to help people to come back in the community and some people were saying, no, no, this, that and that. And there was a something within me that sometimes I'd say, I don't think this one's ready. Okay. Yeah. So it wasn't a case of if you're black, you can come out kind of thing. It wasn't like that. Everybody just got treated fairly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and that's what I did. Um, in, in that so that gave me good grounding and I began to realize that I was doing a vision that I had when I first became a Christian of setting people free in that uh, so we carried on I was also doing my counseling psychotherapy alongside that um, set up tranquility did various things, taught in places, but still my heart was to work either with prisoners mm -hmm. or people who had mental ill health, largely because I see both of them as the same. Interesting. Yeah. When I explained this, um, and remember when I was talking and making my changes um, to come in, I said, I see both of these people fulfilling that scripture for me. Because if someone's mind is broken mm -hmm. and their liberties are restricted and people shy away from them, then they're in prison. Mm. Because there's only so much they could do. Yeah. And if someone's in prison, they are directed when to wake up, when to go to bed, when to eat, when they'll move out their cells, when they'll do that, when they'll leave, um, and so on and so forth. So although their circumstances might be different in terms of how they'd live and how they'd be treated afterwards. Yeah, that is key.